Dark save for light being cast from the big TV screen and the imminent sunrise that's teasing the one starry sky with whispers of morning. Hey, George. Hey, Lions. How's it going? You know, it's good. I'm just taking my shot. I want to throw away my shot. <laughs> gun puns. <laughs> nice. Oh, yeah. No, prepare for ton, tons of gun puns because you know what's about to happen. We're about to welcome to the gun gym. We've got fun and games. Yeah, man. No, <laughs> it's good. <laughs> oh, man. We, this, I'm so happy with the way this is starting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. No, like it. And, and I've had that. And the weird thing is, like, I don't know why those two things are related, but like every time I'm like, you know, queuing up Gungeon, I'm like, oh, we've got fun in games, you know, like just that, that song just rocketing through my head, man. Cause I mean, like this, the, the, somebody, I, I swear, I swear, somebody said, like, like I want to make a bullet hell game. And it's like, they're like, but what, what's the aesthetic? What's the theme? It's like, dude, nail on the head, bullet, bullets, hell. In hell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Does what just, it says on the tin. Yeah. Just, box it ship it let's go do some cocaine you know so uh we played enter the gungeon um <laughs> so so we anybody... played duck hunt yeah so <laughs> oh geez <laughs> bullet hell game no shooting gallery anyway yeah. <laughs> <laughs> although now i'm imagining yeah. a bullet hell version of gun of uh duck hunt and it's terrifying well no the bullet hell version of duck hunt would be you play as the ducks there you go oh yeah. my god that'd be some fun retro Nintendo at us. Yeah, seriously. Note to self. Duck hunt. Duck POV. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so Gungeon, uh, it actually, it's newer than I thought, sort of. Like, I was thinking it was more like 2014, 2015, but actually came out 2016. So it's a tiny <laughs> bit more recent than I thought. Um, and it came out the day before my birthday, which I assume... They're like, they don't care at all that I waited three years to open my birthday present because I never played this before now. <laughs> <laughs> well, to be fair, this is if, if if they did make this for your birthday present, they don't know you very well because if they said, hey, we really need to get some lion something for his birthday and somebody said, we should make a very well-crafted bullet hell game, somebody should have stood up in the audience and been like, uh, are we sure that that's the way to go? Oh, no, I can I can needlessly refute that. So, uh, yeah, sweet. <laughs> yeah, no, so my whole life, uh, there's been certain things that are generally popular that I just don't particularly care for, right? Um, mm-hmm. And one of those things is uh, smoking. Like I just I don't mm-hmm. I don't smoke. I don't. It's just all all manner of things that you could light on fire and then breathe the smoke in. It just it hurts. It's uncomfortable. It doesn't taste good. I don't like it. Um, but I will occasionally indulge mm-hmm. in a cigar. And yeah, the will. reason I will occasionally indulge in a cigar is because someone I know. Mm-hmm tried apparently like thousand cigars mm-hmm. because he needed me to be able to smoke a cigar with him and mm-hmm. he found the one cigar so smooth and unthreatening that he was like lions will suffer through this this is it i mean no because like it was <laughs> i was like stumbling through the deep jungle brush <laughs> of cigars you know like trying to find the one and then all of a sudden like i pushed aside you know like this like like large outcropping of cigars and i saw like standing on a golden idol the one cigar and i was like this is the one lions will tolerate if it's not this one then it's none other ones and i will always remember as you took that first deep very satisfying puff you looking at me and saying i am so angry with you right now because cigars are not healthy and that cigar was delicious yes (laughs) good good yeah. But, uh, so I'm thinking that whoever made this was like, oh, no, but Lions doesn't really like bullet hell games. We shouldn't make a bullet hell game. And they were like, I guess we just have to make the best bullet hell game ever made, which, you know, we're giving this away a little bit. But if you've never heard of this game, this is like a ridiculous like we're, we're going to spend the time here gushing, I think, a lot. Yeah. Right. So we liked it. Um, but I, I was looking up because I was curious. Right. It, it's a roguelike um Side note to my side note: Would you call this a rogue like or a rogue light? 
I would actually call it a rogue like. Um, I know it does have some elements that would make it closer to a rogue light. Like it is not a pure, like you know, purest of pure like rogue likes. But that being said, there is no mechanic. Like you can, the first time you pick up the controller, you could run the whole game mm-hmm. reasonably. You know, like unlike in Rogue Legacy, where is it technically possible? Yes, but it is insanely laughably unlikely like this one it's the, the only thing from that when you pick up that controller to you running the whole game is your own skill yeah that's true and and really the items you unlock and the guns and things there they are to help you close the gap right they meet you in the middle because as you unlock stuff presumably you are getting better and the guns are also aiding you right so the, there's there's like a synergistic growth um but the reason I agree with you that I would say it's a rogue like and not a light is because all of the stuff you unlock, all of the extra sales people and stores and things, you still have to get to them with whatever your starter equipment is. You never mm-hmm. start with more life. You never start with new guns. You never start with any items. You never start with anything different. You always, I mean, there's the four different characters, but you always go in with whatever that character, five? You can unlock a robot. Well, okay. But <laughs> but the robot never becomes a more powerful robot. It does it does not. <laughs> it is simply a robot. Yeah. So you you know, whatever the robot's <laughs> abilities are, whatever the Marines' abilities are in the hunter, like you go in with those abilities. And that to me, because I, I spent a lot of time thinking about this, is if you always start from square one, no matter what, it's a roguelike. And also too, I, I and we can get into this more mechanics, but like I, I would make the argument that um the new guns that you get add differences in kind, but they are not in and of themselves more powerful. So like at the very beginning when you boot up the game, right, you have class D through class S weapons. Mm-hmm. You know, like those are all available to you. So if you happen to luck out, get a rainbow chest and you know, get a whole bunch of like S weapons and like great great swag, right? then the, the the different guns just give you differences in kind to keep you engaged in the game, you know? But, like, you could reasonably get, you know, the most powerful S-class gun just right off the off the cuff and then just run the game with it. Or the duct tape. The duct tape is awesome. But <laughs> The duct tape is awesome. Um, but anyway, so I, I say all that to say this, which is uh, because this is a roguelike and because this is not my... Uh, let's say this is not my forte of games. Um, I was curious. So I messaged you and I was like, Hey, does this just go on forever? Or does this have like a defined ending? And you're like, no, it has a defined ending. Like there is a final boss. You can, you know, quote unquote, beat the game. And so I know that what makes this game like popular in the nerd community is all of the stuff. Right. So I was like, Oh, clearly beating the game is, a milestone but it's not the milestone where you stop playing because you like Mm want to unlock all the guns and all the items and all the extra shops and all the all the all the all the right so uh i looked it up on uh how long to beat which lets Mm -hmm. you like submit how long it took you to beat the game what system you played it on what style of play you did and the time to beat averaged out to 15 hours which i've definitely put 10 plus into this game and only gotten to level four so i was like well maybe i could eventually like i'd be on the long side but like maybe i could eventually get there the plus extras is 41 hours and then the completionist is 147 hours there it is (laughs) i was just like that's I I can't think of a more numerical way to say the story is not what you're here for than there being an order of magnitude between how long it takes to beat the story and how long it takes to do everything the game has to offer. Like that is just such a concise mathematical way to say you're not here for the story. No, no, you are. You are definitely. Not. I mean, yeah, playing it for the story. You're, you're playing it for the guns, you're playing <laughs> it all for the guns. It's always been for the guns. And then all of a sudden you realize when you're done playing that you just hear the rhythmic thumping of the hammer pulling back on the trigger and you realize you're home. 
<laughs> the gun was in me all along. I'll, a side note, I need to go see a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> I have this gun-shaped hole in me now. So so um, what what are your new nostalgia goggles for this? Because you, I, I think I probably heard of this game around the same time you would have, but you've been playing it longer than I have. Yeah, so basically... Um... For me, I was I'm always on the kind of the lookout for new games that can potentially be within Teddy's my son's purview of like playing, and and I and, and so it's it's kind of interesting because it, it gives me an excuse to try a whole bunch of games I probably wouldn't have tried normally, uh, and just everybody was falling all over themselves about how like awesome this game was online. You know, I just through my normal channels had heard like three just stunning recommendations for it. And I was like, well, it's a top down, you know, it's it's a shooter, you know, like it's a, it's a bullet hell game. So I was just kind of like this, this all feels like if I was like, if there's an easy mode or something like that, or some some way, some accessibility option to like dumb down the difficulty, which there is and we'll get into. Um, I was like, this is something that reasonably Teddy could play. And uh, he he does. And he is actually increasingly good at it um but uh but yeah so i just i, I purchased it and i was just kind of like oh this is pretty cool and uh and then just kind of kept playing it and i was like we should do an episode on this because this thing does some really clever stuff how about you so i mean i i also got to it through social internet channels right because it's a modern game so people have been talking about it recently right it's only a few years right. old um actually it just passed its third birthday i suppose um but <laughs> Uh, there's a uh, a YouTube channel that I watch, and I think you actually also watch now, Donkey. Donkey. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I love his stuff. He's a great critic. I don't always agree with him completely, but he's, he's a good critic. I like the way he mm -hmm. critiques stuff. And the thing uh, that made me want to play this game before you and I had spoken about it uh, was a, uh, a quote he used about it that I actually wrote down. Uh, Enter the Gungeon is the greatest celebration of video games inside a video game. <laughs> and going through is just, you're just drowning in this game could not have existed earlier. Not, and I don't mean right. because of the technology, like the, the technology is relatively modern by, you know, processing standards, like how much crap is going on at the same time. But mm -hmm. The reason this game is different than all the other bullet hell games is because it is built not just on a pile of human skulls and bullet shell casings, but all the video games that came before it. And also other kinds of pop culture, movies, television, music. There's definitely jokes in here that I did not get, but like there are things that are so specific that it was just like, that is definitely a reference to something. And I just right. don't know what it's a reference to, right? But it, it's just... It's one of those things that you need a certain amount of raw materials. You know, you need a certain amount of people to have gone before you, right? Like, you can't be Weird Al before the things you parody. You need pop right. culture be to be Weird Al. Yeah, you can't be Weird Al before Star Wars Episode One. you know? Right. Yeah, you, you need Queen, and you need Van Halen, and you need Spice Girls. Like, all of those things need to exist for Weird Al to exist. Yeah, even like the the you know the the different classes that you can be are all parodies. But I mean, you know, it was like the marine. I was like, you mean resembles but legally is distinct from Doom guy? Like, yeah, that's it's, you know, it's like that wouldn't make any sense without Doom. Yeah, you know, yeah, because it would just be like that's not how Marines look. And it's like, yeah, but it's how the Doom guy Marine looks. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so top of the hour visuals. Yeah, so. This is a pixel art game, which, you know, when mm -hmm. we play uh, new nostalgia goggles, they tend to be. But this game has seriously some of the most beautiful, highly detailed pixel art I think I have ever seen relative to its simple cartoony style. Like, uh, this game is very much in the same kind of bucket as, like, Celeste was, where... Mm -hmm even though everything seems kind of silly and kind of cartoony, there's somehow also this insane level of detail. Like the, the, you know, each, each of the dungeon floors is always the same, uh, like, you know, wallpaper. So like the first floor is kind of like a medieval castle and then it's kind mm -hmm. of like a dungeon and right. But they're, they're randomized cause they're roguelike, but they always have that same 
coat of paint and like the yeah the there's like vines on the walls in some rooms and there's like chipped walls that are you know like zelda walls that you can bomb through and or you know blow through i guess um and there's uh you know like uh, when you shoot books off the table on purpose or by accident, like they scatter on the ground and like papers go flying everywhere. And like, you can actually see the green and blue on the little globes in some of the like library rooms and the, the candles flicker in a different way than the lanterns flicker, which is different than All how which this... you can interact with. Yeah. And like the, you can knock the chandeliers down and like, it's just, it's unreal. The amount of detail that does not need to be there because you cannot pay attention to any of it ever. There's always crap going on. Like yeah. they could have phoned in all of that and they didn't. There is not a single extra pixel or a single pixel that could be taken away. It just feels like everything is exactly as it needs to be. Yes. No, I mean, like I've got, you know, all kinds of like the the sprites are just delightful. I mean, you know, all of the different enemy archetypes are are fantastic. Um, One of the things that uh, just because I want to make sure that I I get it, get get this note in there, because I thought it was just so it's like you said, everything about this game is so well thought out. And, you know, it's there's so much energy put into this game to make it seem so seamless. One of the things I thought was really interesting is you've got a, a map up on like your HUD right which is important because you know when you're looking like going through the gungeon and you and you're saying like well which door should i go through you know you sometimes you can't always see the door so you need to like have the hud up which is great when you enter a room right all of the doors slam shut so you can't go anywhere and the map disappears yep because it would be it's not information that you need because you're not going to be going anywhere or doing anything. It's not useful information. And it absolutely would clutter up your UI. So it's just kind of, you you literally can't like fleeing a room is not an option that the game affords you ever. Uh, There is a, a singular item that will let you do it. But I mean the, literally the rules of the gungeon are you have to kill everything in every room. So there, there, yes, there is the one way, but I mean like the, even then, you, you don't need your map because it just gets you out of the room. You right. know, it's not like you're making decisions based on that information. Yeah. 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 I didn't mean it. Um, actually, but yes. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, but I, I should say, I should preface the reason I was uh, being partic- particular about it is because this is a game that has random free form teleporting and mm-hmm. you cannot teleport out of a room to escape Correct. combat. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And I thought the uh, teleporting mechanic was very, very well done but we'll get to that in mechanics but uh yeah so i thought that that like just when i saw that you know because i think at one point after i'd been playing for some time i just cleared the room and i think for whatever reason i had fired the shot that i knew was going to you know fell the beast and so i immediately like looked up to my map and i'm like my map's not there but then the person the bullet died right and then the map came back and i was like oh i didn't notice that for quite some time and then i was like oh man now now i'm just going to keep scratching at this to see you know (laughs) the other wild stuff you guys are doing that's helping me process this absurd amount of information that you're throwing at me because you feel like such a badass just ducking weaving dodging throwing up tables you know and like ducking behind them and then all this sort of stuff and and they have to be pouring information into you in order to get that accomplished. Um, and uh, one of the things that one of the ways I think they do it is that all of the projectiles are bright, glowing red projectiles. Yes, you know, and sometimes flashing like it's mm-hmm. and and nothing else looks quite like that. So you can never say like, oh, that was a healing orb, but I thought it was a bullet, so I dodged it, right? Like, that that yeah. never, ever happens. They never trick you more than a little bit because there are the mimics. And I, I do have to say that the because, you know, treasure chests are a big thing in this game, and yeah. the way the treasure chest looks tells you a lot about what's in the treasure chest because they're, like, rainbow color ranks, so, like, brown is crappier than... I think green and then blue or whatever up like that. Um, yeah. Mimics look like treasure chests. So you go up to them and then they open their, you know, terrifying gaping maw. And if you played a lot of RPGs and D&D stuff growing up, you would think like, oh, it's going to bite me. But it actually pulls out two guns yep. because it's enter the gungeon. And of course yep. it does. Yeah. Yeah. No, everything... I think pretty much everything tries to quote unquote shoot you. I mean, like even 
the giant hulking knights, like when they slam their sword into the ground, it shoots bullets at you in that insane kind of yeah yeah you i mean you could argue that like the little wizard things like they're casting spells but it it looks and behaves like the bullets look and behave and did you notice the the interesting thing about the specific shapes that the wizards use uh well for me they are um actually no i take it back i was thinking that they're the shapes of the playstation buttons they are, yeah. But I am playing on a Nintendo Switch, and they are still those shapes. Yeah. Why aren't they A, B, X, and Y? Well, because that would be stupid. <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't make any sense. Well, the books fire letters. <laughs> yeah, they do. And sometimes Greek letters and sometimes shamrocks. But, you know. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah. But, yes, yeah, it, no, I don't, it, I don't... it is. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, but yeah, no, I I noticed I was just kind of like, well, that's interesting. So and uh, here, here's a fun counterpoint for your map going away because it clutters up the screen. Sure. Uh, and and I I'm not crapping on this because I think it's a bad thing. I actually think it's amazing. It's just an interesting juxtaposition to let's remove some information so that it's not distracting during the heat of combat. Uh, the guns in your HUD, like to show you which gun you have equipped, it's animated so like when you fire the gun the gun in the hud appears to fire and when you reload it you can see its little reload animation and i'm pretty sure they did that because they were like well we lovingly crafted all these animations and they're kind of small on the sprite they're larger like considerably larger in the hud they were like uh we really just want to show off all these cool animations because some of the guns look weird when they fire because it's like a weird gun and it like makes a creepy like animal noise or it like flips around in a cool way when it reloads. Cause it's like, you're reloading a revolver, like a, you know, movie cowboy. And they wanted to show off all those animations and they're like, we're not, we're not going to obscure this. We're going to literally make it be on the screen <laughs> at all times. So you can appreciate it. God damn it. Yeah. And I, and I, and I, <clears throat> and I did appreciate that. Honestly. Um, one of the things that one of my notes, that's that's kind of in a similar line, which is that, you know when you're walking around like you know your sprites they with any animation that the, the key is that you know you're keeping the aesthetic pure that you're not you know like it would make no sense if all of a sudden in this game like you had similar animation to say you know uh silent hill where it's all like dark and gritty and i mean like this is just over the top ridiculous everything about this is over the top and ridiculous <laughs> right so, you know, like the, the, the sprites heads are like the size of their bodies, you know, um, because they want to be able to show like facial, you know, like things with the face. Uh, the other thing is that the guns are just stupid big, you know, like way. I mean, like it would be like, like literally like, oh, man, did you see that hand cannon he was carrying? You know, like <laughs> it they, they are. Was. <laughs> yes, and and, and the, what really brought it to my attention and I'd say in any other game, not any other game, but a game that did not have this aesthetic, I would say it was fourth wall breaking, but it just, I just laughed about it, which was, it was, I think it was like the Winchester or one of the, the rifles where like, I was just running and walking with it. And I swear to God, it looked like I was riding a broom. It was just so <laughs> much bigger than me. But then in supposed to being like, oh man, that really took me out of the moment. I was like, this is so stupid. Okay, let's go kill some more stuff. You know, <laughs> well, and for the enemies, because it, if I had to do a rough gut check, I would say it's roughly 50 percent enemies that have gun like abilities where they like cast spells or whatever. And then 50 percent enemies that are literally holding guns, right, mm -hmm. where they actually have like a gun or gun like thing in their hands and their guns are also gigantic because that's the characters that actually carry guns, their gun is the tell for when they're about to fire it. So there's like mm -hmm. the, the creepy little fire orb thing that like zips around and then like shoots out mm -hmm. bullets in all directions. And that thing, like it screws up its face and like flashes a little bit before it fires. So like that's its tell. But then for the, the denizens of the gungeon, the bullet I, kin, I believe they're called the jammed. <laughs> I think the ones that look like little bullets are bullet kin. 
Okay. And hey, the, I think I think the jams are the zombies. Yeah. Yeah. The or, ones or the, that are like, all undead. like gray and yeah. Um, yeah. Like like the vampire bull. I think I think they are because yeah. because you can get something that gives you bonuses against the jams. Yes. Yeah. You're, and I saw you're that. I was right. kind of like, God, I love this game. <laughs> Well, but the so the the bullet kin, um, they have yeah. little revolvers as their weapon, and they like mm-hmm. swell right before they fire. So they don't mm-hmm. do like a dramatic, you know, like stop or I'll shoot kind of like action pose because that would be dumb. But the gun kind of doing like a Looney Tunes, you know, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, like swelling of the barrel, like as the bullet moves through it, which makes no sense because is the bullet expanding before it fires? Was it not that size <laughs> always? I don't, I don't quite know, but like that's their tell, right? So those guns are also gigantic and it's, you need that information. Like, and, and if you have other, you know, visual commentary, that's fine. But like the way they communicate what is about to happen really, really matters in a bullet hell game because you and I have played other bullet hell games. We've actually even played other bullet hell games on the show. And one of the biggest differences between a good one and a not as good one is do you ever die having had no time to react? Like crap just came flying out of nowhere. There's no way you could have known. You have to just memorize that at that part of the level, bullets come from that part of the screen. Like, I don't like that. I think that's crappy design. And in this Mm -hmm. visually, and we'll get to sound later, but like visually you always know when a character is about to start shooting at you. And if that character has multiple shooty shoot styles, they usually have a different tell for each one or the the differences travel in a way that is recognizable so you can like adjust accordingly and mm-hmm. th- you need that <laughs> like you absolutely have to have that so the fact that they made it fun and they made it fit the aesthetic and it's silly and it's like super over the top like that's all awesome but for my dollar like it just needs to be there at all like you just need tells so that i can react Yes, agreed. I think that the tells were really good. And one of the other things that I, I, I noticed that, and I may not be perfect on this, but is that the the size of the tell is proportional to the severity of the attack that's coming your way, you know? I'd say that's so true. Like, so, like, the, you know, it, we could take, you know, like, the, the bullet Ken who has the single revolver that fires, like, a single bullet, you know, like... That that tells you know, like yeah the gun like blows you know grows a little bit and it's fine. but I mean it's it's a single bullet and realistically you have no great reason to be all up in their business anyways and you move faster than the bullets typically mm-hmm. so you know even if you missed that tell you could probably work around it versus like the spellcasters they have a good you know visual cue that kind of like shows you that they're about to do a thing you know but you, you could you could potentially miss it but probably not. You know, and then the giant armored dudes, like they're like eyes flash, they wind back, and it's this huge long thing. The same thing with like the gelatinous cubes that like fire bullets out in every direction. You know, it's like this big, big kind of like show that they put on right before they trigger. So you know, like, and and then honestly, it's it's not until way later that you have some enemies that have like fairly aggressive attacks that don't have super obvious tells. And that just makes them more dangerous. Like they feel more dangerous because you're like, I don't, I don't, I don't know. They, they, it almost makes them feel faster, you know, because they don't start their tell as quickly. So you're like, oh God, those things move so fast. It's like, no, they don't. They just don't telegraph as well. So it seems like they're moving faster and that makes them feel more dangerous, yeah. but still fair, which is really clever in my mind. Yeah. And I, I think that's a, that's like a video game staple in some ways is, it's 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 half there needs to be some kind of information to communicate to the player that a thing is going to happen otherwise we're just cheating because they're not batman and their reactions aren't that fast and then there's also um it's not coyote physics but it's in that that vein of like because they are telegraphing that this is happening or about to happen and because most people do not dissect their video games as deeply as we do what ends up happening or the the desired effect is that the player feels like, oh man, like I just knew 
he was about to shoot me and I dove out of the way at the last second. And it's like, no, you didn't just know they told you. You just didn't even right. realize that they told you. It's just you saw the barrel swell and you didn't realize that you connected that with he's about to fire every single time. Or you saw the eyes flash and you didn't realize you connected that with he's about to wind up, which is he's about to make the sorty explodey thing. So like that... I don't think it's a bad thing when players don't recognize those things, but it is a bad thing when they're not there and someone's like, well, how was I supposed to dodge that? What was I supposed to do about that? And it's like, right. eventually, if the tells are there, you will start to uh, internalize them, even if you're not aware you're doing it. Right. And the one final thing I had for um, for a note that uh, was just, I, actually, I had, I had two other things. One was that, um, this was just a minor gripe, which was that there's the little status indicator over you, which says, you know, like when you're about to take status damage, like poison or mm. curse mm -hmm. or fire. And I just, I felt that that was a little too subtle, um, just because there was, before I started to figure it out, there were a couple of times when I was super on fire and didn't realize it and took two or three hits before I realized that it was the fire that was tagging me, mm -hmm. you know, that it wasn't like a bullet. And then rolled and then got it put out. But in a in a bullet hell game where every shred of life you claw and bite and kick for, <laughs> I was a little frustrated because I was like, in, the, in one of the instances, I was on level four, I was having a great run. And then all of a sudden, out of my five heart containers, I lost, you know, one and a half. And like, that's, you know, arguably not that bad. But I was like, no, I needed those heart containers. No, so, it, every, every blow, every piece of damage is deeply felt. Oh, yes. And I think that that's, you know, we can talk more about that in mechanics, but that is a very well-crafted game where, you know, you really feel like every every movement and every decision, everything that you do really feels like it has real weight. So um, there's that. But one of the, the, the things I would rather talk about <laughs> is um, the fact that they're so good at taking like these small little animated sprites and making them so expressive, you know? Like, they are just, and I think that that just kind of all goes into the core aesthetic of, you know, just how, like, wild and zany it is. But <laughs> the the couple of bullets that, like, just get really, really angry with you is just so much fun. Like, the two that pop to mind is, um, one is uh, the, so I'm, I assume that you fought the first bunch, the, the, the Bullet King, the first, one of the first bosses. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, it would have been really random if the number of times I assume you had to play through to get to level four, he just never came up. Yeah, no, many but, uh, many bullet kings were were slain at my hands. I love the little bishop dude. Did you ever? Like, <laughs> yes. If you because if you leave him alone and you beat the boss, he's like down, like begging for mercy, and you mm -hmm. can still kill him. <laughs> and you can still kill him, but if you tag him but don't kill him. He like his eyes start popping and he just runs across the screen at you like some kind of like insane madman, which he is. And it was just like, I was like, oh, no. And I just and like this poor <laughs> little bishop dude who's just like clearly incised because I'm attacking his king and also just shot him. I just put a crossbow bolt in between his eyes just <laughs> in pure panic because he looked rabid. And I was just kind of like, I, and, and I don't know, like that was just. I don't want to say delightful because that makes me sound like a sociopath, but really on theme for this particular game. Well, and I feel like there's a lot of little details that are either completely inconsequential or so mildly consequential that you know they were put there more for the fun than because it makes the game harder or you know more confusing or the puzzles more complicated or any kind of thing like that. And him being in that room with all the other crap that's going on with the Bullet King, he's not realistically a threat. And no. if you die from the little bishop dude while you are fighting the Bullet King, <laughs> you made a fairly grievous error for that to be able to happen, right? He's there because, of course, the king would have like a vizier or whatever he is because it's right. funny that the Bullet King on his gun throne has a little bullet vizier bishop man. Like, it's just, it's funnier for him to be there than to not be there. When you go into a room and all the doors slam shut, uh, the locked door has, like, a little face. And if yep. you, you it like, it's watching you, like, do the yes. fight. And if you get too close to it, it goes, like, it makes, like, a mm-mm gesture, like, yeah. with its little, it, like, shakes its little face. 
uh there's the cells that have like the the extra like shopkeepers and stuff that you can unlock and like you need a special key for those which looks exactly like the big key from the legend of zelda and dude you want to get sued <laughs> they do dude, we have not played a zelda game in forever we should play a zelda game. we should play a zelda game so when you <laughs> when you uh get the big key and then you go to that door that door is a unique door to tell you one i need a key and two i need a different key than the other keys and if you try to go up to it without the big key in your inventory, it makes like the troll face where like the eyes are flat on the bottom and it's like, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. And then when yeah. you do unlock it, it has like a death animation where it looks like it's suffering, which again, mm -hmm. I'm not trying to make light of suffering. Like I understand that some people feel like, no, violence is never, ever funny. I can see the humor in violence when it is ridiculous cartoon violence. So and these all shooting the bishop because he was running at you like a crazy person, like yeah, it's weird to say that that's funny, but it's funny. Yeah, it's pretty funny. <laughs> yeah. And also to the uh, the one other animation that that is similar in that very like kind of you know bringing the whole world together is when and and we have a special section set aside for like references and puns and all that sort of stuff. But when you fight the beholster, um, <laughs> which which is a beholder, but instead of eye stalks, he has guns. Gun um, stalks. <laughs> gun stalks um so he has little little mini beholders right they will spawn and try to kill you and if you kill him without killing the mini ones they just sit there and cry oh yeah yeah they just they just cry over the loss of the beholster and 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 you you definitely can just leave them alone or if you're sitting next to your three-year-old son and playing with them you can just say you know hey Put them out of their misery. Cl Send them to their up in here. <laughs> Yeah, come on. There's a mess. There's a mess in here, which is hilarious because actually my son, because there's so many things, destructibles, like literally at one point before he actually really grasped the full nature of the game, he would be playing and he'd be like, he thought the point was to make a really big mess. So he'd go into the room and just knock around all of the destructibles and go, man, I made a really big mess. I'm like, yes, this is, this is where you can do that. Make the biggest mess you want in this video game. And keep it in there. But now I like the idea of just like sitting there and be like, son, you made a really big mess. <laughs> Clean it up. <laughs> well, and so to that uh, point, like there are a lot of destructibles. One might say like, oh, yes, but it's because it makes the environment more dynamic. You can flip tables over, which, by the way, you said throw up tables, which is just like unacceptable. I feel like I need to censor that like a swear. <laughs> like, <laughs> you flip tables yes um and like if they have books or food on them that stuff goes flying and like that's neat um some of the in is it the fourth floor where the tables are like little coffins yeah yeah and when you yeah, dump them over like the poison the green comes out mm -hmm. um so the, there's little ways that it makes the world feel like richer but there's a lot of pots there's a lot of barrels there's a lot of like things that are basically in the universe just to absorb like a, a shot or two. And sometimes that's really awesome because you'll go into a room and there'll be like a ton of bushes and all the enemies are in the center of the bushes and they start firing at you and all of their shots are just blowing the bushes away. Right. And so it's like, ha ha, like I have the upper hand because you struck first in this case. Well, anyway, I say all that to say this, uh, the hallways between rooms, those were sacred, George. I thought that the hallways between rooms were safe. And some of the hallways are littered with barrels, just pots and barrels and destructible crap. And those things, first off, the hallways are like, like archetypal hallways. They're incredibly yeah. narrow, right? You can't, mm -hmm. it's not like you're just walking down, you know, a university hallway. There's like little tiny narrow hallways. So if there are destructibles in the hallway, you are likely to hit them. Mm -hmm. There's like a one in, I don't know how many chance that a fairy will come out of one of the barrels in the hallway and start shooting at you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I got to tell you, I'm serious. I've seen it exactly once. I swear to God, this is true. Cause you kind of gave me a face. Like I've never seen that. I have never seen that Yeah, in, in all of my time in all of the, the destructibles destructed and tables flopped. I have never seen a single fairy. Yeah. So it has happened exactly once. And here's the thing. 
I've seen the little glowing circle with little fairy wings a lot in my life. And every time up until now, that was a good thing. <laughs> and so when it came out, I started chasing it. And there's a tiny delay between when it comes out and when it starts shooting at you because they know you're going to start chasing it. <laughs> so it starts shooting at me. It and I, you... I, yeah, I just start panicking and just wild firing into the hallway. <laughs> Yeah, we go, ah, ah, no, 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 no. Yeah, no, that, I, I didn't, I, and I put time into this game. That has never, yeah. never happened to me. Well, but, and, you know. and here's the, I swear to God, this will be my last thing about visuals because the visuals will, by necessity, come up a lot in the mechanics. Um, did you get the room with the medical tent? Yes. Okay, so they have a fairy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So I, I'd, I'd never seen that room. That room had never spawned for me. I was literally playing before we started recording the show because I was like, ah, I'm going to play a little Gungeon right before we record. So, you know, it's on the Switch. It's got the it's it's very, very amenable to my lifestyle because I can just like pick it up, you know, unsuspend it and start playing. And I go into this room and I see people and all of the people or people like things like vampires and monsters and robots like they're all safe. Like so far I haven't encountered any that attack you. So I see them, they're in front of this medical tent and I go up and talk to them and they're like, do you need healing? And I was like, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll chance it. I want to know what this does. So, right. So there's a single folding table with a jar with a, a fairy in it, which is very linked to the past and, you know, Zelda and, one of the nurse people, the doctors, she picks it up and slams it down <laughs> and just yep. so the jar breaks over your head and the yep. fairy goes into you and you get all of your health back. Yeah. And it was it was weird because the first time I ran into that, I was like, they're like, you you look like you need health. I'm like, uh huh. And they're like, do you, do you want us to give you health? I'm like, I I, and and the game has just made you so suspicious because the game's so unforgiving. So you're like, there's no way that they're just going to give me health, right? And they're like, blam, it's like full health. And I was like, okay. And I like inched away. And then like I ran into them again. And I was like, now you look like you need health. I'm like, there's no way this is always a good thing, right? <laughs> I ran into them, I think about four times, and I always got all of my health back. But I just, I still don't trust it, man. Yeah. It's just, there's got to be, got to be, a catch there's gotta be a downside man i mean i'm just waiting for like they like slam that thing and then maybe the fairy comes out and starts shooting at you and then i gotta warp some more tables to you know put up some barriers between me and that fairy I'm wondering how many of those you're going to be able to work out <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll see how many tables i can flutz <laughs> so i could lovingly salivate over the the graphics in this uh video game experience uh, we should probably start talking about the audio at some point yeah, we should. Um, so the audio, a hundred percent services gameplay, man. I mean, like we we need to tell like how like fun the audio is and all this sort of stuff. But like, oh my god, like the 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 audio syncs so perfectly with the visuals and is pouring information into your brain unfettered, and it is amazing. Um, you know, like just off the top, like uh, you know, the, the guns fired, collecting coins, closing of doors, um items popping up like all of these things all have a very unique specific sound to them and which is really really important because all of this stuff can be happening off screen the the biggest one that i found to be the most helpful because like it was one of those kind of moments where i was like oh you were feeding me information that i was acting on that i didn't really realize which was you know a lot of the times you enter a room you kill all the 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 jammed the gun dead the you know in the room (laughs) the bullet can and uh yeah and and, yeah and bullet can um you kill all of them in the room and then more spawn right so it makes a very distinct like noise right and then you hear these pops and each pop is a different bad guy spawning Mm -hmm. right so if you hear pop 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 that's four bad guys that are now in the room. And the reason why I knew that they did, I mean, I was acting on all of that information, but when it became starkly obvious was when I heard pop, 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 pop. And then I killed three of them and immediately started hunting the fourth because right. I knew there was a fourth bad guy in there somewhere. The game that I didn't get like tagged. It didn't come out of nowhere. It didn't fire a bullet from off screen, which I would have also heard. It didn't do any of that. I knew that there was another bad guy in this room 
just simply it by the sheer virtue of the sound that it was feeding me and it was it was beautiful well and you get so the the sounds and the visuals very much work in tandem because if you are in a gigantic room and i think it's worth saying that a lot of bullet hell games all of the information is on the screen at the same time that's not true for this game the rooms can and almost always are larger than a single viewport screen. right so yeah so there the enemies may spawn way the hell far away from you some of the enemies, like some of the rooms are so big and the enemies spawn so far away from you that there are multiple obstacles between you and them. So they don't even attempt to shoot at you. So if like, if you get like pop, 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 right. And then you kill three of them and then you're like, nothing else is shooting at me, but the doors are still locked and the map hasn't returned. Right. Mm -hmm. So like, even if, you've forgotten about the audio cue or you're not getting more audio information because you're not being fired at from off screen. There's still visuals to let you know that you're still in combat. And then if they can see you and they do start taking pot shots at you, you will hear them regardless of distance. And they sound exactly the same. There's no attempt as far as I can tell to be clever and be like, Oh, that one fired from far away. And this one fired from up close. It's just like, bullet noises like you need to know that you are under threat so that you can try to assess the direction it's coming from and not get shot so like the yeah. the sound and the the visuals the audio and the visuals i think have to work better together in a bullet hell kind of game than maybe any other kind of game because as someone who who's often in a place where i can't have the the sound up loud I can successfully play this game with no sound or with the audio very quietly, but one, it is way less enjoyable because the audio is just good. And right. two, you are giving up. A, it's like handicapping yourself with it by, you know, cutting out an entire sense. Like you need that information coming into your brain to inform your decisions and you can rely on just the visuals, but you are playing you're you're playing with a, a handicap. It is way way harder. Oh, absolutely. And also too. Um, so this is this is tangent. I mean, like all these are you know, sound and surface of gameplay. Um, out of curiosity, who was your who did you main? So I started alternating characters to try and like get a feel for them. I ended up settling on the marine because the marine is obviously the one that's meant for people who aren't as good. And yep. because uh, the Marine starts with uh, extra armor. So mm -hmm. you have everybody has the same amount of health, but the Marine starts with armor. Uh, the Marine also has a passive ability that makes their shots less wild. Um, and it does something else. But basically the, the Marine is just a little, little bit more easy mode than the convict or the hunter, which are the other starting characters. Um mm -hmm. They all do different things, so I like that they're they're not it's not just easy, medium, hard. Like they do actually yes. service different play styles a little bit more than just easy, medium, hard. Um but the once I realized the Marine was the character that most made up for my shortcomings, I was like, Well, I this is fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I, I played the, as the Marine a lot, but eventually and and still the the my main is the Huntress. Um and the main reason why, you know, I mean, she's got a whole bunch of abilities I really appreciate. Play for my play style, it's great. But she has a dog. And <laughs> and you can pet the dog. You can totally pet the dog. And that is just <laughs> amazing. Um, but that that's not the point. The point is that um, the dog can find items and stuff. So when it does, though, it makes like a barking sound. Like it'll go like, like roof, roof, and then like dig, 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 and then find the item. So that does two things. One is it lets you know, like, when I heard that sound, like, I would just, you know, I blew up the room. I'm good. I'm already heading to the next room, and I hear, you know, the dog bark. I will stop what I'm doing and double back into the room to go figure out what the dog found. And two, it the, is the game suddenly letting you know, like, this is not an item that just appeared when you beat the area. This is your passive ability benefiting you, mm -hmm. you know? So that way... 
you know, you don't just think like, you know, oh man, this this ability is worthless. I never get anything from it. It's like, no, that you this is this is when it happened, which I appreciate it because sometimes I was just like, that dog needs to pull its weight. It is just not doing its job, <laughs> man. Oh, and one other thing is that did you ever get a pet mimic? Once. And I happen to be playing as the huntress, so now I have two dogs. And I know, right? I like, was just, just like, like, if I never come across this random item again, I feel like I got the best version of it right now. Yeah, you did. Yeah, because if you if you're not the huntress, then it's just it's just a little chest that follows you around. But then when you're the huntress, it turns into another dog. And I was like, <gasps> can I get a third mimic? <laughs> <laughs> How many dogs can I have? Exactly. Um, and then it, yeah. <laughs> so I I, I want to just quickly double back to visuals, just because. Um, I, I don't know if I'm projecting or if I'm, you know, overanalyzing, but the, 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 the huntress, are you sure that it's the huntress as in the stereotypically female version of the word hunter? I'm not, I wouldn't slap that on it. Well, th- th- here's the reason I'm asking. The convict was the character that made me notice this. I was like, oh, the convict is not definitely a man or definitely a woman like the the facial features which i mean granted you only see like when you're doing character selection and then otherwise you just see the little sprite i was like the facial features are not overly masculine but they're also not like stereotypically feminine then the marine has a shaved head but marines tend to have shaved heads so that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a guy so i'm kind of wondering if the no it's it's the hunter it is the hunter, right? But the hunter has long hair. Yep. Right. So Which I'm, is not, it's typically feminine, but not exclusively. Well, so. so this is exactly my point, is I think that they designed those three characters to be just, I, is, is androgynous the right word? Just non-gender stereotyping enough that if you look at, the hunter and you decide that that's a woman then it can be and if you decide that it's a man then it can be right and if you look at the convict same way if you look at the marine it's a little harder because of the shaved head and like at least the u.s military does not force women to shave their heads in the military but um i i felt like none of these characters are like grr i'm the man and none of the women are like grr i'm the woman see what i did there right Mm -hmm. (laughs) they don't I, i didn't feel like the characters had specific genders or needed them, but it Mm -hmm. takes when you're, when you're doing art design, even though they're very simple little sprites, it still takes work to not include things that most people will stereotypically leap to. And long hair is one of them, right? Like only one of the characters has long hair and it just immediately makes you think, Oh, that's their way of signaling that this character is a woman. When in reality, I, I get the feeling that they weren't. I think they're all kind of trying to make them like gender non-conforming because there are definitely yeah. characters in the game that it's like, that's a guy, that's a woman. And most of them fit those stereotypes, right? Like more obvious stereotypes. And so the fact that the main characters don't makes me think they're trying to keep them a little bit more like blank slady. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, I I would agree with that. And I think that's a good observation. Um, do you have anything else for, for sound? Um, I do want to talk a little bit about the music, uh, just because it's really good. And the uh, thing about, you know, new nostalgia games is uh, a lot of indie developers or, you know, smaller companies, uh, they will release the soundtrack as a way to get more of them sweet, sweet dollars. So you can often buy or stream the soundtrack to modern indie classics. And this game is no exception. And I was uh, traveling for work and I was listening to the soundtrack while I was working on something. And I was like, man, I sure wish I could hear this music when I'm playing the game. <laughs> because they re- <laughs> they really duck the audio hard underneath mm-hmm. the gameplay because the sound effects are important to gameplay. The, the music right. is there to let you know if you should be amped up or if you can be calm and, and to kind of give you some, you know, audio version of the visual theming and to layer that together nicely. And it, it's really excellent, but they necessarily duck the music really hard. And I mean, I played this game a few times with like high quality headphones on with the volume up relatively loud. And I was like, this just makes the gun noises louder. Like the music is still pretty quiet. And what made it jump out to me the most is 
uh, if you teleport, if you immediately teleport from like the, like a combat, like you just finished combat and you immediately teleport to the shop, it doesn't transition super smoothly because the shop music is like <laughs> kind of chill and it doesn't mm-hmm. fade out the way the, the combat music normally does. It like does a super fast, like uh half transition where like the combat music fades out while the shop music is fading mm-hmm. up and it does it really, really tight. And I was just like, Oh yeah, most of the time I can't hear the music at all. And it's just, right. It, I mean, it's fine. I understand that it's a limitation of the game type, but they didn't skimp on the music. They could have made the music just like phoned in and they didn't. It's actually really ambient. It's really good. It fits. It's different floor to floor. The bosses have their own scary boss music. Combat has its own scary combat music. Like it's, I feel like if they were going to skim somewhere in the budget, they could have wussed out on the music and just been like, Oh, well we're going to duck it every time anything happens anyway, but they didn't. Right. It's really good. It's a really enjoyable soundtrack. No, I mean, the same thing with, like, the visuals when, you know, like, there's a bajillion visuals in there and, a you know, a million things you can interact with that you may or may never not ever interact with. There's nothing in this game where they said, like, well, I mean, they probably won't. It's like, it, it doesn't matter. Like, let's make a whole game. And and because, I mean, I think that one of the core aesthetics for this game is discovery, you know, and so it's just kind of like just every time you find that little thing, like the fairy in the pot that ends up shooting at you or the first time when you walk up to a chest and it turns out to be a mimic and you just lose your mind, you know, like <laughs> like all of those are just amazingly delightful. But uh, mechanics. Well, we need to spend at least five seconds on controls to say that this game is what is known as a dual stick control game where mm-hmm. you use one stick to move your body. And use the other stick to aim your gun. And that mm-hmm. is a very specific style of controls that is somewhat unique to this style of game. I don't really know what other kind of game you'd shove those controls into. Um, chess. Yeah, battle chess would benefit from dual stick controls. Um, <laughs> but I, I was talking Go. to a friend of mine about this game and... I was like, oh, yeah, I got it on the Switch because I really would rather play it with the Pro Controller on my TV, but I know sometimes I'm going to be glad that I can, like, take it with me so that I can get more playtime in. And she was like, "That, that's not a controller game. That's a game you play with a keyboard and a mouse. And I was like, I... T- what? I was like, it's literally a dual stick game. Like, that's a category of game is dual stick games. Like, that is it. It's like bullet hell. Like, that's an entire right. s- subgenre. And yeah, she yeah. was like, but it's a shooter. You want precision. You want to use a keyboard and mouse. And I was like, I don't, I'm not disagreeing with you. Like, I don't know how to continue the conversation past this point because I have never played <laughs> a dual stick game with a keyboard and mouse. I mean, I guess you just, you know, literally just point and click which in my mind almost makes it easier to the point where it's it kind of almost takes something away but that's interesting i I would not have thought you know like playing this game i just it's so inherent that that is the ui that uh um or that that's that's how you interface with it that that i wouldn't have thought you know like oh yeah or you could point and click i'd be like but no that's not right that's not how you do that yeah and and I think it's still hard because, you know, WASD movement controls, I think. So you you would be a more accurate shooter, but possibly like a less nimble person. So maybe that Mm -hmm. balances out a little bit. I almost want to buy another copy of the game just to friggin try it with the keyboard and mouse because I just my brain is like, it's a dual stick game. If you don't have two sticks, it's not a dual stick game. Exactly. And actually, that that does uh, lead very nicely into one of the things I did want to talk about, which are the accessibility options in this game. Um, more specifically, there is an option uh, that is auto aim, um, which means it doesn't have to be a dual stick control game, even for dual sticks. It just automatically points you at the bad guy, right? Um, which is the only way that my son is able to play because literally his hands aren't big enough yet to to properly hold the controller and then hit all of the buttons. So he actually he actually plays it a little bit like you would a keyboard and then he sets the controller down in his lap and then places his hands on top of it and then moves them around, which I've watched. And it's but he's I'm Mozart like, on that thing. <laughs> <laughs> but like it's it's like uh, 
Gattaca with like the six fingers. <laughs> but um, but uh, but the thing that I thought that was interesting is not only can, is that a feature where you can basically say like, listen, for whatever reason, you know, I lack the ability to aim well for any any reason, including the fact that you're three, you know. Um, because when I was I was initially looking for an easy mode, and of course there isn't that, but making it auto aim for you is basically easy mode. But there's absolutely no, you know, like question what how the game is supposed to be played. Not only is that an option, but there's three settings for it, which is always off, always on, and auto detect. And the nice thing about auto detect is what it defaults to. So I didn't even know that this was an option until Teddy was playing for about 20 minutes, and it basically looked at the, it was like look you're missing enough we went ahead and turned this on for you and it it's it's big it tells you with no uncertain terms like we have now turned on auto aiming and if you are like hey you know what screw you game i don't need that you can go and say like never turn this on and then right below that is a setting on how accurate you want the auto aiming to be so if you're like yeah i want to auto aim and i want to be dead on accurate every single time like i need it on super easy mode you can do that. Or if you're like, no, I want it to be about as accurate as I would be normally, you can dumb it down. So I just think that the nuance in that one feature alone is basically the difficulty setting for this game, you know? But they never, like, make you say, like, oh, you you little baby, huh? you're going to play it on very easy mode, baby, huh? You know, like, you never feel that way, you know? So so let me let me ask you how hard you stress tested this. The because I, I happen to have my switch right next to me because I was playing the game before we started recording. So <laughs> I'm, I'm playing I'm li- the game right now. <laughs> yeah. So I'm literally done talking to you. I'm just going to play Gungeon. No, I'm, I'm literally, <laughs> I'm, I'm literally, <laughs> <looking. episode> ends. <laughs> it's so tempting. I'm, I'm looking at the settings as we're talking about them and uh, the controller aim assist amount. How sure are you that that only impacts when auto aim is on not okay i didn't i didn't mess with it well so here's here's the reason i ask um i definitely saw improvement over the lifetime of me playing this game and i would say somewhere around the 50 percent mark like you know if i let's, let's just say i put in 20 hours between when we decided to play and this recording somewhere around the 10 hour mark i was looking through the options and i was like oh you can not have it auto aim, but there's like this assist thing. So I actually Mm. interpreted these as two separate settings. Mm. And what I would really love Mm. to find out is that they are a combined setting because that means I got better more on my own. Like I did definitely get better setting or not, but I turned the, the assist up a little bit and then continued to play. So, I mean, I, I did get 10 hours better, but I also turned up the assist a little bit, but I, I never used auto aim. And now I'm kind of like, when we're done recording, I want to play around with <laughs> auto aim on to just see how it like affects my brain. Because part of me is going to know that I don't need to aim. So am I going to screw up because I'm trying to make myself not bother aiming? <laughs> like I sort of wonder how my brain will handle that. When the interesting thing with the auto aim feature, because, you know, Teddy and I would just switch off playing, uh, is that if you are aiming, your aiming takes precedence. So if you, you know, say like if, if you're actively aiming, it will acknowledge you and you'll be playing normally. But then if you stop aiming, it will auto target to like the nearest target, which is actually in mm. and of itself an interesting thing, because if you have auto aim on Yes, it is auto aiming for you, but you can't then pick your target. So I can't fire at something further away from me. It's going to fire at the closest target, you mm-hmm. know. Um, so, so the nice thing is, so occasionally when I was playing with Teddy, um, he would have auto aim on, and I'd be fighting a boss, and I'm not going to be the one who dies, right? Because <laughs> then, then like we have to play again because they're like I killed him, you know, and and it's like, dude, we gotta you gotta go to bed, man. You you gotta brush your teeth. We're done here, you know. So occasionally, if that was the case, I would literally just thumb off the aim because I'm like, I want all of my shots to hit. I'm not playing for me. I'm playing to beat the boss. So, so it was like kind of like a nice little like mini option that whenever I was like, I don't, I'm not playing this for my skill. I just want to get past this. You just thumb off the aim and then it would auto track an aim for me, which was kind of nice. Mm. Yeah, I'm going to definitely, I want to try playing a little bit with it on because I... Like I said, I I did not come to this game with any talent in this 
this controller scheme and I haven't left it with any either, but <laughs> one of the things, and it is actually far much further down in my notes, but like one of the things that blew me away about this game and how finely tuned it is, is that I improved. Like mm -hmm. I, I came yep. in at, you know, one level of ability and the game gave me information about things that were good and things that were bad. And I was able to internalize that information and get better to the point where now, like if I don't get the master shell on the first floor, I'm kind of mad at myself. Yeah. You get frustrated. Cause you're like, oh, come on. Right. Whereas before I probably died 30 times before I beat the first boss, like not exaggerating. Right. And to see that kind of, not just like, Oh, you got a little better and then you plateaued and then you got a little, like a step function, but just to have a mm -hmm. consistently smooth improvement curve feels like a Herculean task of game design. Sorry. It feels like a Xena warrior princess task of game design. <laughs> like it would just be so hard to make a game that is not so hard forever, right? It starts right. out hard and it's, it's hard probably for most people, even if they're pretty familiar with these games, because there's all these little quirks and nuances and things you got to learn about the universe, but to have it not do jumps in difficulty but to just feel like oh i'm a little better now i'm a little bit better now i'm a little bit better like you always feel like you're one run better mm -hmm. and that's yeah no it's absolutely. incredible oh yeah no i mean and and that that and it just speaks to again like the visuals the mechanics the game all of it just comes together to to help you along the way um one thing i did just want to touch on in the options menu just as a fun little aside is um one of the nice things is because there's no voice acting all of the characters are sprites, all this sort of stuff. It's almost infinitely localized. So, you know, like, because basically all you have to do to, you know, change the language is you just go, I mean, it's like changing the language on your phone. And I say it's like changing the language on your phone because at one point, Teddy decided to dink around in the options and changed it to, like, Korean or something. Like, like something non... you couldn't even pretend to futz through. Yeah, exactly. So I, like, literally... I literally brought up the game and it was just all in, you know, just not even Roman, Roman characters. I was just kind of like, <laughs> Oh no. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and I pressed like one button and it just brought up more. I'm like, I haven't played around with this game enough to even begin. So I literally had to bring up, you know, language options on my phone and have them like, like do a walkthrough. It's like, Oh, are you, are you like in your, like, you know, are you, are you so technologically illiterate that you don't know how to change the language on this game? That's fine. Here's a step-by-step -step walk. I'm like, I need this because all of these are bizarre symbols that I can't read at all. And I just followed it step-by-step -step until I got to language. So the moral is that you can play this game anywhere. It has a whole bunch of different languages. I know because I cycled through most of them until I got back to English, the one language that I actually speak. Yeah. Uh, fun fact about the Korean writing system. If it was in fact, Korean, um, it's the only modern language where the writing system was planned. Like it didn't evolve naturally over time. Someone's like a, they attribute it to the king, but like a group probably sat down and like designed the Korean writing system, which makes it, it's a hard language to learn if you are going from English to Korean, but it's an incredibly easy language to learn how to read and pronounce because someone actually said let's not make it english let's have a bunch of really consistent rules that we don't break and aren't stupid so they didn't as opposed to most other languages where they just kind of like put a whole bunch of letters on the table and then just grab the table underneath and just flapped it you know just flap it right over so uh <laughs> you know susan is korean she is bilingual mm -hmm. she can read and write in korean we were going into a store one time <laughs> And there was a big sign on the front that was in Korean. It was probably an ad for something since it was on the front of the store. But I, I just pointed to it and I said, what does that say? And she said whatever the word was out loud. And I was like, well, what does it mean? And she said, I have no idea. And I was like, but you just read it. And she was like, well, yeah, I know what it says. <laughs> but I don't know how to translate it into English because I don't know what that word is. And my brain because i grew up monolingual i am unfortunately still mostly monolingual like my brain had never grappled with that idea like obviously i have read words in english that i didn't know what they meant but it didn't occur to me that that's a thing that happens across languages because i'm an idiot <laughs> yeah 
Yep. No, that, 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 that is interesting. And yeah, it'd be like if somebody came up to me and said, you know, Hey, what's that say? I'm like, it says flanking tables. And then they're like, what does flanking mean? I'm like, in this context, no idea. Yeah. Yeah. It was just a weird. And every time somebody talks about like, like, Oh, these crazy Korean characters come up. I first think, but it's so easy to learn how to read Korean. Doesn't mean you'll know what it says. <laughs> Every time somebody says these crazy Korean characters come up, I immediately think of some fun animes. But, uh, <laughs> I, love, but, I love them animes. They're so good. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that um, I kind of wanted to touch on is, and this is this is kind of a, a little bit of a philosophical conversation, is cycle time in roguelikes. Okay. So, so here's the interesting thing, is that there were times when like like okay so you know the idea with the cycle of time is if something bests you right it's the amount of time it takes between when it beat you and when you get another crack at that thing you know so, okay so i'm gonna before you even finish your initial question in a roguelike i would consider the thing i'm getting another crack at the entire run i run exactly okay right <laughs> Because in, in most games, I would say the thing I'm getting another crack at is like a specific platforming challenge or a puzzle or right. a specific enemy, not starting the game from the beginning. Exactly. Because there were definitely some times when, you know, I was frustrated because I'd find a new boss, you know, and, and you know, they, they, they do telegraph well and they do all of their, their, their stuff very well. But that being said, you know, like there's definitely something to be said for having seen some of this I, their their patterns before you know and so i get my butt handed to me or there were some bosses where the minute i walked in i was like nope that's game i yeah. cannot or you just you ball. know you don't have good enough guns so it's like yep. it will wear me down yeah no the 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 four daleks because i don't know what the hell they were supposed to be but they're definitely daleks they're, they're, they're daleks <laughs> as a boss every time i saw them i was just like and that's game hendrix but uh but then I'd get frustrated because then it kicks you back to the beginning. I'm like, no, I, I, I want to see what's next. But in my, then in my back of my mind, I was like, well, A, I haven't earned that yet. And B, it's not like I'm going through the exact same stuff that I've completely mastered over and over and over again. It's different, you mm -hmm. know? So, like, the challenges are different. The rooms are different. The, the boss layouts are different. So all of it's different enough that it's still enjoyable and challenging and, you know, like you said, like you, you see how your run kind of builds out because there were definitely some times where I took like three hits like right off the top, got some dumb water pistol out of a thing. And I'm like, well, this this run's gone to hell. But then all of a sudden, you know, like I got like extra money. I bought an extra heart container and then I got, you know, the judge as a weapon, which is <laughs> awesome. And uh, and then just started like wrecking house. I'm like, no, no, apparently, uh, apparently everything's coming up, George. So. So, yeah, so I did want to, like, touch on that because I thought it was an interesting way. You have to recontextualize what cycle time is in a roguelike, you know? Well, and and something else that this game does, and I'm fairly sure that as of this episode, we have never discussed this explicitly. Um, at least I have can't think of a time. discussed it implicitly? <laughs> Somebody, <laughs> if I'm wrong and you're a super fan, go outside of your house. Um mm -hmm. Get me that feedback. But I, I realized, because uh, there was a couple of things I wanted to uh, look up to get specific uh, phrasing of quotes on some of the funny jokes we were going to talk about in a minute. And mm -hmm. while I was on the Enter the Gungeon wiki, they mm -hmm. made reference a couple of times to cool and curse. And I was like, uh, I need to know what these are. <laughs> and when yeah. I looked into it, I was like, oh, you have some amount of coolness and that mm -hmm. affects the universe. And you have yep. some amount of curse and that affects the universe. And these are what I believe the industry refers to as hidden stats. So mm -hmm. you can't check unless you know all of these, like the, the ingredients that affect your coolness and your curse. There's no way for you to just like pause and look at the menu and be like, oh, I have plus 15 cool and minus 12 curse, right? And so when you're like, oh man, I'm getting just really crap items, like it might be because your curse is super high. Or you're like, oh man, everything's coming up millhouse. It might be because your coolness is super high. And it's it's everything, like the amount of damage you've taken, the certain items that you have in your inventory, certain weapons that you have in your inventory can raise and lower your cool or raise and lower your curse. And, and I think there are definitely lots of video games that use hidden stats for things like 
you know, we never allow you to actually know how much health you have remaining. Like when you're below 25%, the bar is meaningless because we're not going to let you die in an unspectacular way, right? Like lots and lots and lots of video games just flat out lie to you so that you have a better experience. And I don't think that that's a bad thing, but in with hidden stats in particular, where you, you don't know that this information is even happening, right? It's, I think it really fits well with a roguelike because it adds a layer of randomness that makes failures feel less like they're your fault. Like the world was just against you and it's not because I suck, but they make your victories feel more spectacular. Cause you're like, yes, I found this amazing gun as if you had anything to do with its placement. <laughs> right. And, and so it's like, it's an interesting thing in a roguelike that you're like, Oh, when I suck, it's because the world is an ass. And when I'm awesome, it's because I'm awesome. And it's, yep. It, I, I don't know for sure that that's linked directly to hidden stats, but it, it certainly feels like it is. Yeah. I know that like one of the things that can raise your cool is the cigarettes, um, <laughs> which cracks me up because yes, it's just yeah. like, well, the game's already all about guns. Like, are we really going to shy away from drug and alcohol <laughs> references? <laughs> Yeah, but one of the things that because uh, you know the, the the cigarettes make you lose health, and I just there, there's this one little story that I want to share, which is so I'm playing with with Teddy, right? And um and so there's the vampire that will drain your blood mm. to get it'll, it'll take health from you to get money, right? So I'd beaten the level, and there were like four total pieces of heart like spread around the level, right? So I was like, well. I, and I was at full health, so I was like, well, I'm going to go talk to this vampire dude, right? Have him drain my health and get money and then go get the extra health, right? Makes sense. And so Teddy, if he's, like, you know, getting frustrated or bored, you know, like, he, he was like, he's like, Dada, go, Dada, go, right? And then he, he'll go, like, like Dada, stop, you know? Go like, Dada, stop. You know, like that kind <laughs> of, like, you know, like a three-year-old, right? <laughs> so um, so I'm sitting there just, like, spamming the the suck my blood option, and it makes this very distinct visual where he, like, bites you and it makes this like noise like <laughs> right you know and so i just did that and he was like oh looks like you you know still have some more life i'm like hit me again hit me again and i'm like just doing like this banal task right until all of a sudden like i realized on the like the fourth one like <laughs> look over and daddy's just staring at the screen he goes Dada, stop because <laughs> 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 then, then it just came came screaming to me is like that he's just watching me like horribly hurt myself at the hands of this other no i don't want to do this anymore i'm like oh right sorry we should probably just move on then let's just move on (laughs) no baby everything's fine i just (laughs) need to sit for a second (laughs) (laughs) but i mean we can i mean i you know we can go on for ages on the the amazing mechanics in this but you know i don't and we also have to talk about all the crazy puns so what, what what's the other like top mechanic thing that you want to hit on? Uh, so I actually think there's a segue from mechanics into crazy puns. Ooh, go because uh, I don't think all of the puns could just be. Uh, they're not just there because they're funny, right? So they're there because they're punny. <laughs> so a good example of uh, where I think the the mechanics and the silliness kind of play into each other is like say you didn't know what a rocket launcher was, like you'd never seen a bazooka. When you get one of the bazooka-like weapons, it has a chamber of one, right? Mm -hmm. And it has uh, usually a lower total ammo count, usually less than like 200. And man, if you see something that its total ammo count is a two-digit number, you're like, this is the most powerful weapon in the game, right? Yep. So there is a mechanical... Like you, you gain some knowledge about a gun you've never seen before because there's a lot of them. You gain some knowledge mm-hmm. about a gun you've never seen before by how much uh, it can hold in a single clip and how many total shots Rounds it can hold. Yeah. And yeah. if you've never, like, say, you had no idea what a rocket launcher is, and there's a joke in the description about, like, you know, causes explosions, it's like, oh, well. Okay, so now I know something about what this does. It probably does a crap load of damage and it probably causes an explosion, which means it might like cause explosive barrels to explode. It might start a fire, which can cause ongoing damage, right? So, because a lot of the weapons are, it's not immediately obvious what they're going to do. And some of them, even if you think you know, it still does something a little different. So, having 
some information so that you're like, okay, I'm going to try this gun and maybe I'm going to try it in like a controlled environment (laughs) is like, I feel like some of the, the puns and the jokes and the way that things look actually do communicate some like game relevant information there. It's not just humor for humor's sake. Yes. Agreed. And that is a great transition. Thank you. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Also just one, but my, my one final thing was, uh, I do like how mechanically some items, for whatever reason, sometimes that's making sense, will play off of each other. So if you get item A and item B, they enhance each other. Mm-hmm. Like, um, for like one of them, I think it was like the Corsair, which is the most useless freaking weapon in the world. It's just basically <laughs> like a battleship. But if you get something else, it creates the Black Sail, where your bullet fires cannonballs as it because as opposed to being like a normal naval ship, it's now like a pirate ship. <laughs> right. And I'm like, this is... This is so stupid, and I love it because then I would just fill the level up with cannonballs everywhere. But uh, so, but yes, yeah, so I thought that that was very interesting. So you know what ship has black sails? The Black Pearl. Yes. Is it the Black Pearl? Uh, probably. <laughs> so, <laughs> so re- references. What, what you like? Because you sent me a list of like, hey, here we can review this. And honestly, I didn't do that at all. But I've got, for me personally, I've got one reference that I felt. Because, I mean, there's tons of them. There's, like, you know, the proton pack from, like, Ghostbusters, right? There's, there, I, I really like the glass cannon, you know, because <laughs> I was, like, I, I, like, paused it and, you know, turned the back. And I was, like, so the funny thing about glass cannons is, and, you know, like, just kind of went through the whole thing. But um, The funny thing about jokes is explaining them to people who wouldn't have found it funny if they'd gotten it in the first place. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but uh, but there's one where I saw it and I was, like... This this I feel clever for actually making the connection between it and the source material. Okay, so uh, we we were talking a little bit about this in the pre-show. I have a large list which I I'll go through quickly. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, they draw from video games, a lot of video games, uh, but also just like a ton of pop culture, right? Like a lot of movies, a lot of TV show. Um, there's probably all kinds of crap in there. Like I don't get the reference of. But as soon as you said there is one specific one that stood out to me, I was like. I'm so sure that I know what it is. I don't want to slap bet over it, but like I'm going to be devastated if I turn out to be wrong. Go for it. Okay, so we agreed it's not an item, it's a gun. It's a gun, yes. Is it the AU gun? No. No! <laughs> All the pieces are there, George. It's a chemistry joke. It's a golden eye on N64 joke. How? How is that not it? <laughs> No, that was that was really good. Like and and you know, like I, I I was like, oh no, that's that's really clever. But the reason why I didn't feel clever for putting piecing it together is because like it is it's it's like you said, it's all there, right? But it's a chemistry this one, joke. It, it is a chemistry <laughs> joke, but this is one where I was like, there's really no reason because there's nothing in it that I could see that would link it back to the source material. But okay, it, can I can I can I have one more guess? You have as many guesses as you want, and we're just wasting everybody else's time. <laughs> you, you can be <laughs> wrong until the cows come home. How about this? I'll give you one more guess, but then if you if you, if you want a third, that one's that, gonna be the slap bet. Yeah, no, that that's fair. Because eventually it's like a first taste is free kind of thing. <laughs> um so is it the uh tetronominator or te- tetrominator? I'm not sure I even got that gun. Okay, so here's why this was my second guess. First off, the the AU gun and the... By the way, anybody who didn't put it together, uh, in Goldeneye, you have the golden gun, which only Mm -hmm. holds one round or kills everything in one shot. In Mm -hmm. uh, Enter the Gungeon, the AU gun, AU is the chemical symbol for gold, uh, the chamber also only holds one shot. So it is an obvious reference to that gun. The reason I guessed the Tetrominator is because... It fires um, tetronominoes. It fires Tetris blocks. Mm-hmm. But the reason I that I thought you would be super proud of yourself if you got the reference is because the flavor text for that gun is line piece. <laughs> and I was like, that is a deep cut. It is a deep cut to have a gun that looks like Tetris blocks that fires Tetris blocks with flavor text that is referring to a college humor sketch making fun of the fictional Tetris god who makes the Tetris blocks fall down. Oh, I missed that entirely. I don't think I've seen that college humor bit. So yeah, no, that that is a deep cut, man. I missed <laughs> right? most of that. Yeah. Uh, okay. No, so I, I'm not interested in purchasing a third guess. You, you don't want to purchase them. 
So this this is the one that I really really just got a huge kick out of, which was it was the 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 wind up wind up pistol wind up gun because it makes the pop goes the weasel that one when you crank it that's why it's called the wind up gun. Yes, but what where is that gun from? Oh my god, it's from Futurama. Yes, it is. They use the yes. Yes. And it makes the Pop Goes the Weasel reference. Mm-hmm. Oh yep. my God, you're right. Yeah. Where it goes like, do, 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 do. And it doesn't fire. If As you fire it, the bolts get weaker and weaker. It just like fries when he fires it and goes like, you yeah. know. Oh yeah. my God. If I had put that together, I might have used that as a guess. But this is a good example of how deep these cuts are because. I know, right? <laughs> I had the list of guns with their flavor text and what they look like in front of me. And even with all of that information and leisure time to study it, I was still like, <laughs> I have no idea what some of these are. I have no yeah. idea what some of these are. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, like, literally, it's just, I mean, just getting all the different guns. I would get excited to get another gun just so that I could get all of, like, the figure out you know like what what weird abilities it has because all of the guns have like these like different not there's no two guns that are exactly the same you know like uh i mean like they're all just a little different like there are some that are very similar they're all just a little bit different so every time i get a new gun i'll be like oh what does this do you know and then like the weirder the better it was just insane but then but then yeah you would get and you'd be like oh my gosh like there's one i, I forget it's i forget what they call it but it's it's the nes pistol from duck hunt yeah you know? it's the they call it because that's on my list uh they call it the light gun which is mm-hmm. what a lot of people called it because that's how it functioned but it was actually mm-hmm. called the nintendo zapper i believe mm. Yeah, and so like they they had the you know the light gun you know, and I was like I was like ah it's a Nintendo gun, and then my suspicions were confirmed when it fires a duck as the last you know as the last round. Yeah, right. But again, amazing flavor text because the flavor text for that is third party, as in it is a knockoff. It is not the Nintendo Zapper. Yep, exactly. Like just all of those insane jokes that, that again you know Discovery being the core aesthetic to this game. Yeah, you know, you're just like all the time. You're just kind of like oh. Oh, what 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 new new interesting thing am I going to find in this like chest? You know, it's just uh, it's just delightful. So I, I I did spend a little bit of time compiling this list. So for my own you know sake, I'm gonna go through it. Um, yep. so the the items that jumped out at me as just being particularly funny um, was the enraging photo uh, because the caption is "Don't believe his lies," which is a reference to Memento because um, mm-hmm. it's a picture of Teddy. Right. And that's the main character carries it around uh, the bloody eye, which slows down projectiles from the enemy, which is a reference to Cowboy Bebop. It even looks exactly like it. Um, all of the. I don't know how you say this, the Guan stones. Oh, yeah. Guan stones. Yeah, yeah. they're like D&D. The iron stones. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I was just like, that's just delightful. Um, and then there's uh, the iron coin and this, the flavor text literally just says, instead of Valar Magulis from Game of Thrones, it says Valar Morganis, <laughs> which is just like anywhere they could fit the word gun in, they did. Um, some of my favorite guns uh, in no particular order, uh, the bullet and the shell, because they yes. are, they look like ammunition that fire entire guns. <laughs> Yes, it is a bullet that fires guns that fires bullets. And I'm like, because of course it is. It's just so stupid. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. Uh, the Cold 45, which is because there's a Colt revolver and then mm-hmm. a Colt 45 is also a kind of alcohol. And the flavor text is Shatterday Night Special because it freezes <laughs> enemies. Uh, the AU gun yep. we talked about. Um, the, I like this one just because it's it's recent for us as well. Uh, the Knight's Gun, which has the flavor text of Plowshare, and it looks like Shovel Knight's Shovel. Yeah. And mm-hmm. then if yep. you go really deep, because if you open the Ammonomicon, there's additional mm-hmm. information beyond the flavor text. And that one says it's a gun made by like a race of traveling sentient yachts. And the only reason that would make sense is if you know that the company that makes Shovel Knight is called Yacht Games. Jesus. Right? Like yeah. Deep, deep cuts. Yeah. Um, the shotgun full of love and the, the shotgun full of hate. Um, not because I, I don't know if that's a reference to anything specific, but the shotgun full of love fires like unicorns and rainbows that just bounce everywhere. And it's just amazing to witness. <laughs> uh, there's at least three guns that reference Metal Gear Solid, which I found delightful. 
Uh, they have the Mega Hand, which is obviously Mega Man's, you know, Mega Buster. Um, mm-hmm. But then I realized they also have one called the Heroin, and it's Samus Aran's arm cannon. Oh, nice. Yeah, I, I never that. got that one. Yeah, no, I, th- I only saw it in the, the list, but I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, the Proton Pack, you know, because I was a big Ghostbusters nerd as a kid, um, you know, any of the Nintendo reference ones. Um, but one of my uh, favorites that I, I think it's there just because it's funny is uh, the Silencer which looks like a pillow and it fires <laughs> and it fires pillows. Mm-hmm. But the flavor text is 300 dead count. <laughs> yep. And it's just like, every time I would read a pun like that, I was just like, I'm laughing and I'm mad at myself for laughing, but I'm laughing. Yep. And then oh, yeah. the, the no question worst pun in the game, because it is literally just a repeat of the worst pun ever made is the freeze ray has the flavor text ice to meet you. Which is a reference nice. to Batman Forever. Uh, Batman and Robin. But yes. Bat, uh, who's the villain in Batman Forever? Uh, Two-Face and the Riddler. Oh, and then Batman and Robin was Mr. Freeze and yep, Mr. Poison Freeze and Ivy. Poison Ivy. Yeah. yeah. I'm glad I didn't know that for sure because that means I only watched that movie once and then never went back to it. Oh, you should hang out with our uh, with our friend Frank. He actually owns a copy of it. It's his favorite. Uh, I've heard it. Favorite one I, I was yeah. surprised because he's such a Batman fan. But when I found out that was his favorite one, I was like, only someone who understands Batman as deeply as Frank, our friend Frank, right. who is a mm-hmm. big fan of Batman, would big understand fan. why Batman and Robin is the greatest Batman movie absolutely and i mean he loves it i think he's he's owned that video uh, that dvd for many years now he refuses to get rid of it i've offered a couple times to be like hey man i'll take it off your hands i hear that this is like a kind of a stain on the batman culture and he's like nah no he, he insists on hanging on to it guy loves batman you should but, definitely um, buy him a copy on streaming because he has surely warped the dvd from watching it so many times so many times so but, many <laughs> so all that being said does the game yeah Yes. Right. Just yes. Do you just want to say yes? Yeah. I mean, it, it obviously yeah. not only did it learn from history, but I mean, I, I cannot say enough that this game kind of like Shovel Knight, um, a little bit less like Celeste, but like we've, we've played a handful of Nostalgia Goggles games now. And like Celeste is just one of the best platforming games ever made, but it, it doesn't directly draw from obvious pop culture it just built on the shoulders of of its predecessors right um Mm -hmm. shovel knight has lots of deep cuts but it's not it doesn't need those deep cuts they just chose to like make it more charming and funny in that way this game could not exist in a world without all of the pop culture it's built on because then it wouldn't be this game the 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 mechanics and the play style and the the aesthetic are equal parts of the triforce right one is not obviously superior to the others one is not foundational and another is a capstone like they are equal parts of the whole which like so much else that they've done is just an incredible feat to say you know this game looks amazing and sounds amazing and you will never feel like you died unfairly and you, you, if you came in sucking as bad as lions does you will still manage to get better if you like stick with it and enjoy it like i didn't feel like i was just plowing my way through it like it's just th- this game is a freaking masterpiece it's a masterpiece it's just it's so, <laughs> it's so so good like i would uh to to steal a page from your you know how you assess these games like i would recommend this to anyone because i don't yes. like this kind of game and i still found it to be incredibly enjoyable yeah no i mean uh, same same thing like the game is just top to bottom i mean you know the re- main reason we played it is because i was like i have now logged tremendous sums of hours of this with my son and uh and we absolutely 100 percent should play it who would i recommend it to i'd recommend it to anybody who enjoys nerd culture and i mean if they were like oh well i'm terrible at this type of game or whatever i'd just be like look man there's accessibility options just turn auto aim on turn the assist all the way up and just play this game um and normally i'd have like some kind of like cool pun or or like way to to you know bring it all together but um you 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 mentioned something towards the beginning of the episode um there's like a possibility that now like a heroin addict i am just jonesing for like nobody's business which is if we don't play a zelda game i'm going to florp the hell out of this table <laughs> uh.
All right. The curtain falls. The music plays. The credits roll. Then it all fades to black. And you're left by yourself. The fanfare is gone. There's no player two there by your side to share victories won. But as you slowly progress down the hall to your bed, a few great events leak back into your head from the time that you spent traversing the land. Battling evil, fighting the darkness, just sword in hand. Your memories creep in with the end of a smile. You realize again 